Do you want an 800 on SAT math? If so, stop with the overpriced prep and endless practice. All you need to do is master this one cheat code. So today, let me show you everything you need to know about Desmos because I guarantee you haven't seen what I'm about to show you. Now, before we get into the video, this is an advanced Desmos course. So if you see symbols and topics you haven't quite seen yet, go ahead and watch your fundamentals video shown right here before we come back to this one. And this is part one of a multi-part guide. So make sure you tune in for future videos and tips. Enough said, on to the video. Starting off with topic number one, regression from a table. So in the context of tables and graphs, regression can be used to find an equation based on a set of given data points, which are going to be your x and y coordinates. So a couple indicators to look for to determine if you can perform regression are, number one, do you have at least two coordinate pairs? They can give you coordinate pairs either in a table or just list them individually. And number two, this doesn't always need to be there, but do you have a function you can put into your regression? Right here, we have g of x equals f of x over x plus three. Both parameters are satisfied, so we can go ahead and perform a regression. But first, let's take a look at the problem. The table shows three values of x and their corresponding outputs, where g of x is this, and f is a linear function. What is the y-intercept of f of x in the xy plane? So the first thing I'm going to do here is create a table and plot my points. So to do that, I'm going to go into the first slot and type in table to get me, for Desmos to give me a table, and then I'm just going to plot these points in. And so once I'm done with that, I can see a little feature right here that says add regression. So if I click that, I can see that I can command Desmos to create any type of graph I want based off of those three points on the graph. This can be linear as shown here, it can be quadratic, it can even be cubic. But for this case, I want to perform a linear regression. So now that I know that I have my equation for g of x, I can just set this equal to f of x over x plus three and I can set up another regression to calculate this. So what I'm going to do is type in y1 because my outputs in the table are measured in that notation. And then I'm going to use a sign called the tilde sign, which is right here, to set it equal to f of x over x plus three. But now you see that um, this is not going to work. You're gonna get an error, and that is because Desmos does not support function notation. So what I have to do is I have to think of an equivalent expression for f of x. Well, here in the problem, it says that f is a linear function. So what's another way to write that? Well, the standard form of a linear function is mx plus b. So instead of f of x, I can just write in mx plus b. And it still doesn't work because right here, like I did for y1, I need subscripts next to the x and x1. Without the subscripts, Desmos cannot perform the regression. But once you do that, you can see that you get m, you get your slope, for f of x and you get your y-intercept for f of x. The question asks for the y-intercept of f of x, which is just going to be 36. All right, moving on to topic number two, exponential regression. So in the context of these types of problems, you're going to get exponential expressions that are equivalent and you're also given some sort of a restriction. So these two pieces of info are going to be enough for you to know that you can just put this into Desmos and get an answer. So first, what you do for this problem is just copy this equation into Desmos and that's going to give you this output right here. And so as you can see, it tells you that x cannot be used as a regression parameter. And so what you have to do is assign a subscript of one next to x. And the reason you have to do this is because for x and y to be used as valid variables in a regression equation, Desmos requires you to do that. So I'm just gonna put in one right next to each of these x's. And so once I do that, you can see that I'm getting one for all of these variables. And so Desmos will default to this, which is a problem because our equation has to work for all positive values of x. And so we have to define that. So to ensure the exponential expression is uniquely specified, we need to use at least two test values for x. And this is going to correspond to the fact that two points are required to determine the graph of an exponential function. So essentially logic aside, exponential regression requires two test values. And the way I'm going to define these test values is just type in x1 into the next slot right here and then set it equal to two, any po two positive numbers in brackets. And so I'm just gonna use one and two. And so now you can see that I'm getting actual correct values for A and B, and now I can just type in A over B, which is what the problem requires. And so I have this decimal right here and I can convert it into a fraction using this tool right here. And that is going to give me one over 24. 
So this is how you can use Desmos for these types of exponential problems. Make sure to define x with the list. All right, moving on to topic number three, systems of equations. So you've probably dealt with these types of problems in a graphical setting by plugging in equations into Desmos and then finding the point of intersection from there. Now, this is a great and efficient approach, but when you reach those problems that are pretty complex in terms of variables, as well as have multiple sets of equations, it can get a little complicated and messy. And that's where regression comes in. So to solve these kinds of problems using a regression, what I'm going to do is first set it up in Desmos. So the first thing I'm going to do is create two pairs of brackets, pair one and pair two. And then I'm going to set them equal to each other using the tilde sign. And this is what's going to tell Desmos to perform a regression. And now I'm that set up, all I have to do is just interpret what I have in this problem and then put that into Desmos. So first, this problem is telling me that there are an equal number of sophomores and juniors. And so what does that mean? I'm going to say that sophomores are O and juniors are J. So O is equal to J. And I have to put this into Desmos. So on the left side of the equal sign, I have sophomores. And so that left side is going to correspond to the left pair of brackets. On the right side, I have juniors. And what's on the right to my equal sign is going to correspond to the right side after the tilde. So this is how I'm going to set it up. And then I have my next set. The number of seniors, so I'm going to say that's S, is more than twice the number. So is 20 more than twice the number of sophomores and juniors combined. So that's O plus J. And so now we notice that we have two different sets of equations. I have to differentiate that in Desmos. And the way I'm going to do that is by using a comma. So I'm going to put a comma to the right of O and the right of J. And what this tells Desmos is that from this point on, you're dealing with a new set of equations. So again, now I have S on the left of my equal sign, which I'll put right here, and then all of this on the right. So that'll be 20 plus 2 times O plus J. And then I keep doing this for my third and fourth sets. So again, right here, it says there are 20 freshmen. So comma. F for freshman is equal to 20 by using a comma right there. And then set four, if the number of sophomores, juniors, and seniors combined, so that'll just be O plus J plus S is 80% of the club's participants. So 80 and then just shift by to get percent, 80% of the total number of participants. So that's going to be all grades, freshmen plus sophomore plus juniors plus seniors. And once I do that, you can see that I'm getting values for all four of my individual grades. And what do I want? I want to know how many seniors are in the club. So I'm just going to type in S to get the number 60. There are 60 seniors in the club. All right, moving on to topic number three, the mod function. It is pretty limited in terms of use cases for SAT math problems. But when you need to tell Desmos to force a variable's numerical output to be an integer or non-integer, it is an essential tool. So taking a look at a problem where you can use a mod function, this is considered to be one of the hardest SAT math problems. And a lot of people, what they do is they first try to solve this equation through Desmos. So what they do is you have an expression and then it can be rewritten as this times this and this times this. In the first one, A and B are supposed to be positive integers. And in the second one, C and D are supposed to be positive non-integers. And so what they do is put both of these in Desmos. So you just start off by plugging in your main expression and then use that tilde sign to set this equal to this, your first factor pair. And when you do that, you'll actually see that you do get positive integer values for A and B. So A is indeed seven and B is indeed one. And so now you have to do that for the second factor pair involving C and D. So I'm going to copy paste this into this and then replace A with C and B with D. But as you can see, you get your same positive integer values for C and D. And that is because Desmos is going to default to this if you don't command it to force non-integer values. So even if it works for one half, it doesn't work for the other half. And then you've wasted so much time by now, you have to do it by hand. And that's how this problem ends up taking a lot of time. So all we need is a way to tell Desmos that 
C and D are supposed to be non-integers, and the way we do that is through the mod function. So what that is, is just toward the tail end of our problem, I'm just going to add in squiggly brackets mod C comma 1 is greater than 0 0.001. And then you see that I do get non-integer values for C and D. But like any other problem involving exponential regression, I have to create a two element list that involves two positive numbers for Desmos to give me the accurate outputs. So I do have to type in x1 equals in brackets any positive numbers. I'm just going to say 1 and 2. And so now that I've done that, I actually get more realistic integer values for C and D. And you can see that when I do that, that little x1 that was up here, that goes away. So when you do this, now you know that you're doing the right thing. And now you have A, B, C, and D. So you can just add A and C, and boom, you get 8.5 as your final answer. And so that's why the mod function is super helpful. Another thing about the mod function is if you want to force positive integer values, what you're going to do is instead of 0 0.001 like you do here, you would just say mod C comma 1 is less than, so not greater than, less than 0 0.001, and this will force Desmos to give the output in integer values. And so this is how you just use the mod function. Okay, final topic of part one of this Desmos guide, sliders. The slider is a pretty well-known tool in the SAT community, but a lot of people don't know how to use it to the extent that they can. So demonstrating that in this question we have here, the quadratic function ax squared plus 200x plus c has at least one real solution. What is the greatest possible value of ac? So first, I'm going to plug this equation into Desmos. And so now we just have to consider what the question is really asking. We want to find the greatest vast value of AC where we have at least one real solution. So we just want to hit the x-axis at least once. And so the greatest value of AC is one singular number. And so any combination of AC would be valid so long you get this singular number because it is the sole number that can be the greatest possible value, right? So why can't I just minimize a number and maximize another? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say A is 1. And then I'll just say C is like 100 or something. So obviously so far, I'm nowhere close to getting that one real solution. I still only have two. And let me go up a bit. Let me go to a thousand. Let me go to a thousand. Again, my graph is moving up, but I'm nowhere close. So I'll go to 5,000 now. And then I'm getting closer, I'll go to 8,000, get even closer, and then I'll go to 10,000. And as you can see, actually 10,000, when I go all the way up to 10,000, I hit the x-axis directly at least once. Even if I go one more up, it goes too high. If I'm too low, if I'm at 9,999, it goes too low. So 10,000 is that perfect value of AC. So basically with sliders, what you want to do is you just want to figure out what you're looking for. And then once you're done with that, you can just manipulate the slider in any way you want until you reach that parameter you're looking for. And to prove that any combination works, what if I said A was 10,000 and C was just 1? Now, obviously, you're not going to get a solution at the same point, but you will get any solution. All you want is one real solution. And so you get that real solution right here. Now, before y'all leave, if you want to practice more hard and actually tested questions like these, you need to do what I'm about to show you. This is Prep Hub's very own AI powered website where you can get access to over 300 hard and actually tested SAT math problems. And the best part is the first 30 questions are absolutely free. So if you want access to these 30 questions, go ahead onto our YouTube channel, click the link in our bio, open that AI waitlist and sign up so you can get notified of everything you need to know about this website.